This is Sid Ogaiva, and thanks for listening to It's Recording Time Media, the most pathetic show you could listen to. You really should be listening to something I do, like Kaivacorp.com. recognizability and I thought it would be fun for my dad, who is John Wesley Shipp Sr., if I used all three of my names. So I'm actually junior. Interesting. Yeah. Nice. So uh, let's just get into it, shall we? I mean, so uh, you were on uh, a show that everybody here has probably seen an episode or two of. Um, uh, well... Holy crap, my brain stopped. So we're just going to move past that question. <laughs> Fantasy Island was, the, was the, the show I was going to mention. Fantasy Island was Susan Lucci. Was that uh, 77? That, that was like 81. 81. 81. I was on Guiding Light. She was on All My Children. Right. Later, when I went back to play this horrible character, Carter Jones, on All My Children, while I was doing a play on Broadway, after The Flash, uh, I saw Susan again. And she told the executive producer, she said, you know what John did the first time he met me? She said, what? He said, he picked me up by the elbows and started doing shoulder presses with me. <laughs> she's big. Well, she's, yeah, she's, she's fun size. Absolutely, let's stand, stand up. up. Yeah, yeah, she's, she's such a tiny thing. I said, Susan, I did not. She said, yes, you did, yes, you did. Was it just you trying to, like, assert dominance, or? No, no, I thought it was fun. I said, oh, you're so tiny. It kind of broke the ice. We had a bed scene later, so it was all good after that. <laughs> so, uh, I assume we've all seen the 1990-1991 Flash. Uh, so, what was the process like in getting that role? I could imagine, you know, we kind of come from the dark and gritty, which is kind of laughable now, 1989, Tim Burton, Batman. Um, do you think this was sort of an antidote to that? Sort of like a bright and cheery? No, actually, Carmen Infantino, it's exactly kind of the opposite of what you said. Okay, good. Up to that moment, uh, comic stories had kind of been spoofed on television, right? And, uh, and, the, uh, and the Tim Burton Batman ushered in a new way of telling the story, saying, we're gonna let the rest of the world in on a secret that all of y'all have known for decades, that these are themes of classical drama, these are unblessed sons who get extraordinary abilities, these are, in my case, the death of a brother who I assume the powers to avenge his death, this is a father who is wrongfully convicted of killing his wife in front of his 10-year-old son and only his son believes he's innocent. You all knew all this. The rest of the world thought it was Zam Pal Fush. Right? So Tim Burton read the heels of and uh, <laughs> I want to roll. Nice, Steve. I'm 
technically challenged. <laughs> so my friend over here was going, I was like, what, have I got something on my shirt? Anyway, so that sort of reset the template. And we came in behind it with, uh, with our Flash, and we really took the character darker than the Flash historically had been. You know, because we wanted to have the tension, we wanted to have the darkness, we shot at night. We had fire trucks out on all of our sets, wetting everything down to give it that dark, menacing look. Carmen Infantino actually, I heard, said, Flash isn't supposed to be that dark. They're always shooting at night, everything's all wet. But we had to redefine the way of telling these stories, which I think we successfully did, and now, the new show can come in behind it. They shoot in the suit in the daytime. Grant Gustin wears that suit like a second skin, you know? I never wanted to say dialogue in the suit. I wanted it to be monosyllabic. If I'd had my way, they would have only shown a piece of the suit at a time, almost never reveal the whole thing. So I wanted it to be threatening. As an actor coming from New York, I had already been on Broadway once. I had two Emmys for my work in daytime TV, one opposite Julianne Moore, the other opposite Kevin Bacon. They're all one degree of Kevin Bacon now. He was my dressing roommate on Guiding Light. So anyway, and uh, I was nervous when they first came to me and they said, you know, a superhero show for television and I, I was a little bit nervous about it because, you know, uh, I didn't think that's where my talent lay, I went from where my interest lay. And then April Webster, multiple Emmy Award winning casting director for Lost and a whole bunch of other shows. She talked to me on the phone. She said, John, just read the script. Read Paul DeMeo and Danny Bilson's treatment. That's all I ask. And I read it. And I found out that um, it was what I said earlier. It was okay in our version. Here's this son, second son, who decides to work in the crime lab because his mother doesn't always want to be worried that all of her men may not be coming home that night, right? So he's CSI before CSI was cool, right? <laughs> and so I go into the, into the crime lab. My brother Jay is a street cop. My dad, played by the I, truly iconic Emmett Walsh, you know, real cops work the streets. You know, I, my beeper goes off, I, I go to work, and, and my mom, played by Priscilla Pointer, says, uh, be careful, Barry. And my dad says, what's he gonna do? Stub his toe in a footprint? Ha, 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 ha. You know, so, so Barry's fine with that. And then suddenly, this accident happens to him, and he gets these extraordinary abilities. And suddenly, he can do things that would make his dad so proud of him times a thousand and he can't tell it. So I'm thinking, okay, all right. And I also loved what Barry's first reaction was. He went to Tina McGee, he said, I'm not gonna be a lab rat. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take this freak stuff away from me. I have no interest in being Hugh Hollywood hero. That has not been my life script from the beginning. I don't intend to start now. And then his brother gets killed. And I love Tim Thomerson. And I love, despite the fact that Tim was the blessed son, and I was the unblessed son, you know, archetypally, that we still had that close relationship, you know? And when he gets killed, then it's on. Then it's like, okay, now I've changed my mind. I want a hood so nobody can know who I am. And like that red blotch that the motorcycle gang is terrorizing the city with, I want an insignia of my own. And I draw the flash arrow and it's on. And I'm thinking, I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can play this. And then I audition. I think they saw about 60 guys for the part. I was gonna ask, what was the audition process like? At what point did you get fitted for the suit? You know, obviously it was probably a pretty popular role. I'm sure you did more than one audition. Oh my God. Uh, anyway, but network tests will take years off your life. First of all, you have to go to the studio, it was Warner Brothers, and you gotta get their stamp of approval, and the creatives, and Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo, that took two or three meetings, auditions. And they saw 59 other guys. And then they decided on two of us that they took to the network, for the network test. Now, 
here you are, this actor, you know, just out to LA, and you walk into this conference room, and there are 25 executives from CBS and Warner Brothers, and it's, I'm telling you, it's like Armageddon, you know, who think, uh, how am I gonna get through this? Anyway, they read me, and they read the other guy, and they uh, offered me the role, but not right away. They, uh, they asked to see other film, other tape. About three days later, they made an offer. My manager, Hank McCann, who cast all of Herb Ross's films, he's mentioned in the uh, movie The Player. At one point, they say, get McCann. He was this iconic casting director who managed a couple of people, Ken Olin, me. Uh, anyway, so he called me and said, yeah, so they, uh, they made an offer. I said, oh great, I got the part, what'd you say? I said, I thanked him very much and hung up the phone. Was he I said, playing hard to get? You were what? He said, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, I think you're very... Hey, hey, this is my, this, you know. By this point, the bus was so enormous, the most expensive show Warner Brothers had ever done for television up to that point, and uh, it was a coveted role, and uh, so many big names wanted to already guest star. You know, um, we had Angela Bassett, we had the guy who's starring uh, in Network on Broadway right now, who played Lyndon Johnson. Uh, somebody help me out. Brian Cranston, we had Brian Cranston. No, no name actor, never heard of him, never seen him. Michael, Michael Champion, you know what I mean? We had all these, all these people lined up. Mark, a little actor named Mark Hamill. <laughs> And so, you know, by this point I was invested, so I'm like sweating it. So he calls me back about four or five hours later. I think he's in a, on a train going from Washington, D.C. to some... He said, yeah, they called back and, and they upped the offer by this much. I said, oh, great, it's on. It's, I, well, what just did you accept it? He said, I thank them very much. I'm up the phone. He did this like three times. I swear, I'm not going to make it to 80 because of him. You know? And uh, finally he said, okay, I think, we've, I think we've gone about as far as we can go. And he accepted the offer. And then the process of being fitted for the suit, the body cast, the individual muscle pieces. They spent $100,000 in 1990 to build four suits. And uh, that's a whole other story, which I won't get into unless somebody asks a question, because I'm doing run on answers. So, yeah, actually that was one of the questions. What was the process of... Getting in the suit versus getting out of the suit. What was the longer process? You probably could just sort of pour you out of it, I assume, at the end of filming. Well, it was hard to get out of because by then it was soaking wet. Yeah. It stuck to my skin. You'd go like this, and I was the sponge, you know? It, it looked, at least externally, like it was made of velvet or velveteen or something. I could only imagine it was probably just rubber or something, like a wetsuit on the inside. What yeah, but the, the way they built it, they brought me in, Bob Short, Academy Award winner for Beetlejuice, building the suit. They bring me in. I don't know what the process is going to be. They say, okay, strip to your underwear. They grease me down. They wrap me in cellophane. I'm not asking any questions at this point. <laughs> and then they put a spandex suit on me. It was black, a spandex form-fitting suit. And then they began to... Well, that's after they did the body cast. They made the individual foam latex body pieces. Then they began to glue a peck on a shoulder, you know, they, a quad. They would start gluing the muscles on individually. And then I found out why they greased me down and wrapped me in cellophane, because the glue, when it set, got hot. And then they, they let that all glue on. They took that off. Then they took it and put an electromagnetic charge through the suit and flocked it with a red material that gave it that, that velvet look. And then I put it on and we're doing these tests. You should have seen the first test of how we get the special effect, because we pioneered some of the techniques that they're now using on the new show. But at first they thought, well, we don't want the floor to be hopping up and down. So why don't you try doing a Groucho scoop? So at three in the morning, for about three hours, I'm going across the back lot. <laughs> And uh, that didn't work. And then they fed, and they finally said, I was like, yeah, just let me run. Just, I'll, I'll just run. And so that's what we ended up doing. But I had this tick, because the suit was so big, that I didn't realize I was doing it. 
<laughs> Danny Pilsen came up to me and he started laughing. I said, what are you laughing at? He says, well, you're kind of doing a, uh, what is it, the, what character in the cartoon would, before they take on, would go like this, and then, boom. So I, I Exit like, stage right, even. Yes, so I go, and then, boom. They said, no, that looks funny. You need to just go, man. <laughs> just need to go. So, you know, we worked out the kinks, and, but literally, they would take my gloves off, and they would be full up to the wrist in sweat, and they just dump the water out. They came up with a vest like race car drivers wear that had tubing in it, and, uh, and uh, you could circulate ice water through it. I couldn't sit down in the suit because it would crease. So they brought out this old lean board that used to be used at Warner Brothers for the costume epics. And I would get up and I'd lean on the board. They'd pull the hose out of the back of the suit, hook it up to an ice chest, circulate ice water through the vest, and jolt me awake, you know. So, uh, yeah, in those days we had to glue the mask here and under the chin, and uh, so once I was in, I was pretty much in. And uh, they couldn't clean them. Well, that's why they needed the four suits, right? Well, no, there were two for the stuntmen, two for me. Uh, so I, at five in the morning, I'd take it off, it'd be ringing wet, they'd hang it in my trailer, and they'd spray it with Lysol. When I went to put it back on, it was still wet and sticky, so I broke out all over my back. At this point, I stop, and I say, nobody wants to hear someone who has been privileged to play one of these characters stand up here and whine. Oh, the suit was so difficult. Did anybody take that as whining? No. no. Uh, you know, I am grateful that they didn't stick me in a pair of red tights. Because as Bob Short said, if you just put somebody in a pair of red tights, you could be Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's going to flatten you out. It's going to remove your definition. So they built a really high definition, high tech suit. Having said that, there were challenges. And we all have our superhero suit stories, don't we, Captain? Absolutely. So... You mentioned a, a name that I'd be remiss in talking amongst you know my fellow nerds. You mentioned Mark Hamill. Yeah, man. Um, do you have just a quick thirty-second, two-minute story about Mark that you'd be happy to share with us? There are no quick thirty-second stories after sixty. <laughs> you got time, right? I'll just warn you right now: there are no short answers. Um, Mark Hamill. Well, the thing about Mark, as I said, I was very self-conscious. I didn't want any B-roll in the suit. I didn't want any pictures of me by craft service eating, you know, uh, cheese doodles in the suit. I didn't want to turn into a mascot. There is a picture of me up on the lean board with the cow back with a Diet Coke in this hand. Close your ears. <laughs> this can never happen. Your butts. And a cigarette in the other. It was the 90s. Man, don't ever let that picture get out. But uh, I was very self-conscious. As I said, I didn't want to say dialogue in the suit. And you can see I'm stiff in the suit at the beginning. Well, here comes Mark. Work in that unitard. Right? He is, you know what, to the wall. He is not, he's taken no prisoners. And I thought, wow, well, if Mark Hamill can be that comfortable and that committed you know, by the time we got to the last episode, it was the trial of the trickster, and I had on the trickster boots with the suit. He had me mind controlled, and we were fighting the police and being goofy. I finally relaxed. So I got it right just before we went off the air. <laughs> so, where do you think the Flash would have gone if, if it had gone further in, into the series? I think they were planning rogues yeah. for the, the season. So we would have seen like a Zoom. We would have seen. Would we have seen a grog? I think so. I think so. Although, I have to tell you, the reason it took us nine days, two units shooting simultaneously, I was there 55 to 80 hours a week. You can imagine the hours the crew put in. Well, our transpo department, it was not unusual for them to put in a 25-hour day. Okay? And uh, our guest stars would come in, except for Mark. He would have stayed there around the clock as long as it took. He'd still be there, right? He'd now. still be there, right, so. right now, working it. But uh, by about the third day, you know, we started an episode at 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning. They woke the director up out of his hotel. We finished the previous episode, and they called him to the set. And he's like, 
<laughs> you guys are crazy. He said, what are you talking about? We have a good seven hours we could shoot because they were tent in the back lot to shoot day for night. But the problem was we didn't have CGI. And so, um, as Mark has commented, if we wanted that scene where we had the semi and we blew up the cars and shot flames 40 feet in the air, we had to really do it. We were out on the back lot or in different areas that had the right buildings and architecture till five, six in the morning, almost almost every day. You know, we'd work till nine or 10 a.m. Saturday morning. We'd be back in at 7 a.m. Monday morning. So even though we were budgeted as the most expensive show Warner Brothers had ever done, we were always over our budget. Now, they can do a lot of that. It looks fantastic, CGI in post-production, which gives them time, you know, to tell the characters, to tell the relationships, to tell the stories, which is one thing I think they're getting really right. You know, I loved going in as Henry. I was so glad they didn't ask me to come back as Jay because Henry was a different character. My dad was not wrongfully convicted of killing my mom in front of a 10-year-old me. That wasn't our origin story. That would have been a little grim. And when, well, that's the new <laughs> show. No, no, believe me. In 1990, that would have been grim. Now it's like, oh, yeah, we all know Batman's story, and this is as bad as that. <laughs> so when I found out that that's how Jeff Johns had blown up the Allen family, I thought, if they come to me, that's the role I want because we would still get the passing of the torch, but it would be not as on the nose, it would be in the form of a father-son blessing. And when I found out Grant was the only one, Barry was the only one who believed I was innocent, and I said, okay, all of our scenes are gonna be in Iron Heights, in a cubicle on the phone, that's gonna force us inward. In a big show with lots of spectacle and action adventure, I figured the lights would go down, the music would soften, we'd step into those booths, we'd pick up the phone, we'd look at each other, make a connection, and tell the truth. Which is exactly what happened, and that's what sold me on the show. I was like, ah, it's not gonna be as good as, the, as what I remember as my memory, but that scene where you and Grant are just like, just you and the glass and the phones, I was like, all right, cool, done, I'm in, sold. Yeah, um, it was so meaningful, I'll tell you, those, those, because we couldn't do our business. You know, there was no tap dancing in the room. You know, you had to sit there, there was nowhere to hide, and you had to make a connection, and you had to tell the truth. I'll tell you, those are some of the most rewarding and meaningful scenes that I have done in my 39-year <laughs> career. Uh, all right, so now that we're on the new flash, there was a, a couple of episodes where you had a little mini reunion, right? So you had some castmates from the original show. Were you hesitant to sort of do that, or did you take it in the spirit of its reverential? Do you mean on the show, or do you mean when we did a red carpet event? I mean on the show. On the show. On the show. No, I was thrilled. Listen, the thing, I never knew when I was working for Greg Berlanti on Dawson's Creek right? 20 years ago that his favorite character was The Flash. I never knew it. I never knew he was a fan of the 1990 show until the 2014 show came along. And here's the deal, and I think this is what people respond to. Our producers are not making a product for mass consumption. They are writing and creating Todd Helbing, Greg Berlanti, Jeff Johns, David Nutter, uh, Aaron, while he was still there. They're writing a show that they want to see. And it just so happens that the world's agreeing with them. And if we like it, that's fine with them. <laughs> you know? But I think that, that communicates. And they were fans of the original show. I was watching a scene. I wasn't in it. Grant, he was in this crime lab. And he's trying to do the centrifuge, and it's not working. And he stops. He gets frustrated. He hits it. He looks this way. He looks that way. He picks up the two, and I'm going, wait a minute. And he, and he does it like this, and then puts it back in. Action for action, that is exactly what I did 24 years earlier. And I'm saying, who directed this episode? And it was David Nutter. David Nutter, he's such a good director to get your emotion up. Right before we did the arrest of Barry's father coming out of the house, you know, he wanted that emotion high. You know, Barry, he's going to look after Barry, the mother, I'm being taken away by the police, Barry! He comes up to me and he says, 
You were my hero growing up. Okay, action! <laughs> we only got time for one take, go! <laughs> so, I'm gonna digress for half a second here and then we'll, we'll start taking questions, but Alex Desaire, I keep forgetting he was an actor because Hepcat, a band that he's in, is, is anyone familiar with Hepcat? It's a kind of soul-infused, ska-infused, have you had a chance to see Hepcat perform? Have I have not seen, seen him perform. Well, Hepcat. you're in for a treat if, if you ever get the opportunity. Uh, so Alex Desaire, as you all know, was, was on The Flash, was in a band called, is in a band called Hepcat. Um, so just a free plug for, for that. Um, so we've got, I don't know. Let's, Let me tell you something about yeah, Alex. Yeah, please, about 15 minutes. Alex would always, he was so grounded, man, because for me, as a young actor, finding myself at the center of the most expensive show Warner Brothers had ever done with my own parking space at the lot and all of this swirling on in two units, shooting simultaneously and me being shoveled, I was, I found myself overwhelmed at times. Not Alex. You know, he would add lib, he would throw things off. They went, they went. I mean, if you're an actor, you really open yourself up for it, right? But it's part of the job. They got my high school yearbook and with the with lots of hair and so uh we were going through and we were seeing different in a scene in the crime lab and alex <laughs> looks at my picture and he goes man that is one bad helmet dude <laughs> i'm like you did not just do that to me of course they kept it in so uh we've got about 15 minutes left do we have any questions Would you like to share your experience with Warner Brothers Batman the Brave of the Bull when you did Professor Zoo? That was gonna be my last question! Oh yeah, I gotta tell you, I again that was another learning experience for me because you know when you're acting and particularly if you're studying Meister, it's all about not doing anything the other actor doesn't make you do. And so everything that I do is coming off of you, and I have to see you, and you have to be in my line of sight for that. Well, we got together with Dietrich Bader, we stood around in a semicircle. And we set our lines into a mic, not seeing anything. Well, it'd be my turn to speak, and I go, sir! And they go, uh, cut, um, John, you have to stay on your mic. Oh, right, 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 right. Voice work. And then I go, so, anyway, so here I <laughs> Cut. So, finally, I got, so I was saying all of my lines like this. Well, after you recorded... Like you were back in the cowl? Like I was in a straitjacket. And, and they, uh, they go away and they animate it. And then they bring you back in to replace defective dialogue. It's your question. Uh, defective dialogue. And so we all came back in. If there was a pop or a snap or electrical cutout. And so everybody replaced their lines. I replaced my line. The difference is I'm seeing Professor Zoom. Suddenly my characterization comes to life. At the end of the session, <laughs> said, uh, John, could you come into the control room? And they said, would you mind redoing your entire part? I said, would I? <laughs> now I know what I'm doing. And so that's where the, oh, the little red booties and all that stuff came. Because I could see what the animators had in mind. And God bless our artists. Because none of us would be here if it weren't for the men and women who have drawn the flash for now 75 years, right? Another question. Young man in the blue shirt. Oh, sorry. Who is your childhood hero? Who is my childhood hero? Who is my childhood What a great question, first of all. Golly, why haven't I prepared an answer for that? That is such a no-brainer. That is like a question, of course, I'm going to be asked. All I can say is the shows I enjoyed watching, I, the, the Wild Wild West was one of my favorite shows back then. Um, I was not a comic book fan. I didn't know anything. I know. I know. Shame. You should have just seen what the expression he made. His eyes he went. And, uh, and when they said, came to me about the Flash, I said, you mean Flash Gordon? Now, of course, if anybody says that to me, I go, no, the Flash. You know, highly insulted. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. But I'm interested to know some of your childhood. Iron Man. Iron Man. Very good choice. Very good choice. Hulk. 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 
All right, we got an Iron Man and a Hulk here. Is Central Casting in the house? We got Team Marvel. Where's our DC people? So we have a gentleman here with a question. <laughs> In your series, I really love the alternate, well not the, the, the possible alternate storyline of that superhero you brought in from the 50s, the Nightshade. I was wondering if you would talk about that. The great, great late Jason Bernard. His son, Jason Bernard Jr., is on Twitter, and I remain in contact with him. I always get warm all over when I think about that episode because in the same way that Jay Garrick is Barry's mentor sort of in the new show, Nightshade was my Barry's mentor and not only as a character but as an actor, there's nobody better than Jason Bernard and getting to play those scenes with Jason Bernard, it will always be one of my absolute or a couple of my absolute favorite episodes, Deadly Nightshade. Mark Hamill. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, I just, he was so incredible. I'll tell you one thing that was very interesting was doing the Pollux episode, where I was the blue flash and the red flash, because I had never done scenes with myself, you know, a typical actor's choice, right? Uh, anyway, so, to, and I had this great stuntman, Dane Farwell. Dane Farwell. I was Barry Allen. Once we got in the suit, Dane Farwell, my stuntman and stunt double, was as much the Flash as I was. And sometimes we were both in red suits at the same time creating special effects. But anyway, he would watch me, and of course I did the Pollock scenes first because Barry was being reactive to what Pollock was doing. Barry was like, uh, get the get out of my face, you know. The Pollock is going, oh my god, I know who I am now, right? And so I did all of that. Uh, and he watched me. And so that when the camera turned around, he mined every action that I did when I had to react to what I had done before. Now, the hours in that episode almost killed everybody because I was in every minute of that show. But stop and think about this now. Here's a part of Barry that he doesn't trust, he doesn't like. Here's this genetically engineered part of himself. Again, he's like, this guy's a freak. Amanda is saying, he's like, he's like a child, Barry. Don't freak him, don't spook him. He's, he doesn't know who he is, he's looking for an identity. Barry says, he's a freak, get him out of here. What ends up happening at the end of the series, this part of himself that Barry didn't trust ends up taking the bullet for Barry at the last minute. And this part of himself that he disliked and didn't trust ends up having taken the bullet for him dying in his own arms. There's a lesson in that. You better be careful what parts of your character and personality you estrange or you ask to have removed because your character defects are the flip side of your assets. That's where my actor's brain and actor's heart goes. So I really enjoyed doing that, that episode. We have another question here. Hi, John, how are you? Hi, darling. Thank you for that little love. Yeah. We can't hear you. To know about the man behind the mask, what what kind of what does John Wesley ship believe in? What what is your causes in life? Well, I'll tell you, and I'm going to live it. I have many, and anyone who's ever been on any of my social media other than Instagram, where I keep it totally personal and career, knows what that is. But let me tell you about Comic Con, and let me tell you about what I believe in about Comic Con. We all come here. We have different beliefs. We have different politics in a very divided nation. We all have our own egos and insecurities. We check all that stuff at the door. None of that comes in here. And we get to relate to each other person to person. I can't tell you the things that I have learned about y'all in these appearances. The times that someone will come and say, I used to watch your show with my dad and he died last year, dissolve into tears and I'm holding this person because they are giving me the privilege of seeing who they are, you know? And so we have a direct line to each other built around our love for this pop cultural art form. 
and that's what it's all about. I call it as, not a safe space, I call it a sacred space. Because that's, we get to be who we are in here. And we get to relate to each other, human being to human being. Great question, thank you. I wanted to know, what is your dream role? What is the one role that if you could... One? Anybody, yeah, yeah, which one? What is, the top one. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to my agent, I said, I want to do To Kill a Mockingbird somewhere, I don't care where. Before I die or get too old, I want to do Professor Higgins in My Fair Lady. It could be at the every other Wednesday night musical theater group in Wadi Paytona, Kentucky, you know? I want to do it somewhere, and I know there is a Wadi Paytona, Kentucky, because I graduated from high school in Louisville, but um, there are two roles I want to do. You know what I really want, and I've gone through my career looking for pieces, whether it was daytime TV, Broadway, independent film, whatever, that have something to say from the heart, you know? And those are the roles that I get because those are the roles that I'm interested in. Listen, young people, your interests, pay attention to what you're interested in because your interests point the way to your talents and your abilities. And so, Regardless of what the medium is, I, 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 I try to find roles where I can bring my heart to it. Because connecting, as I said earlier, with people on a heart-to-heart -heart level, you know, is one of the most special things. It's authentic. Thanks. Okay, one more question here. Yeah, um, I know that you had a brief shot on Elseworlds uh, this past year. The major question which I know a lot of Think of the possibilities. Follow up question, is there an NDA that we can't even be having this conversation? Now, you said, you said if, to tell you if there's something I couldn't talk about it, I said I was very skillful. Does anyone else have any other questions? No, no, no. <laughs> you, I said it's okay, I'm very skillful at talking around an answer. Indeed. I'm going to demonstrate that right now. Outstanding. Think of the possibilities. A version of Barry Allen dies. Jay Garrick is left holding the suit. Now, we're talking about the comics. We're not talking about the TV show now. You know, think of the endless possibilities of all the characters that were all playing for a convergence. I tell you, when I was watching the last part of that trifecta, uh, the crossover, and that came up on the screen, I was like, no way! I didn't know they were building. I figured they were building toward a version of it at some point. But when they said, next year crossover, crisis, I was like, wow, okay. Now, I've been in conversations with Mark Guggenheim, obviously I'm in touch with Todd Helbing, and, and all those details are being worked out now, but I can't wait to see what they come up with, because they always keep us interested. Can we just hopefully see you on a treadmill? <laughs> so we have a question here from, from, from Superman. Yes, sir. Just really quick, I'm, I'm a big fan from the 90s Flash, and uh, I was so happy that they decided to bring you back as Jay Garrett, because it wasn't originally in the, in the first few episodes. Who's your favorite child? Is what he says. My favorite child. The character that I'm most uh, curious about playing at this point of my life is Jay Garrick. I think it was 28 years ago, Barry Allen was age appropriate. It was a trip to come back. You know it was a trip to come back in the original suit? First of all, the technicians rebuilt that suit. They took the old crusty suit that was in the Warner Brothers vault and they sent it to Vancouver, and Ocean Drive Leather and Kate Bain redesigned with new fabrics and materials. They didn't have to glue it to my face, and they made it look so good. And when I walked onto the set, you know, if everyone had gone, okay, can we get this shot in the cans, because, you know, I'm really hungry and it's dinner time. Well, I walked in, and Grant almost lost his mind. He was like, this is the coolest thing we've ever done! <laughs> the only thing that kind of pissed him off a little bit was that Stephen, was in the flash suit with with my my flash. He wanted to be the flash, so maybe hopefully at some point we'll 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 get to see that. What was your question? <laughs> which, of two, which of the two flashes? You know, it's been an amazing journey. I started out as Barry Allen. I w did a brief detour through Zoom. So I've been myself. I've been my own worst enemy. 
I've been my father, and now I'm my mentor. I've gotten to look at this character and this universe from so many different angles, and each character has felt appropriate at the time. So, I don't know if that answers your question. I wouldn't have missed Henry Allen for the world. You know, I wouldn't have missed ushering Grant into assuming that role, knowing what his hopes and dreams were, knowing what his, some of his insecurities were, trying to just reflect back to him all of the incredible qualities that I saw in him that I knew would make him an incredible Flash for today. And you know, people always ask, who's your Flash? I go into those threads and I say, Grant Gustin is my Flash. So, being a fan of the original uh, 90s, how much fun was it to bring Amanda Hayes back to the new one? Because I really enjoyed the chemistry that you had in the original. I love Amanda. We've done, we've done appearances together, conventions together. It, it, it's so much fun. At first she said, no, I don't want to do a QA. and I, I don't really want to do a QA. and I said, of course you're going to do a QA. and a She said, well, what are we going to say? I said, I'm going to say something really stupid and you're going to take the piss out of me, just like you always do. Everyone will laugh and we'll have a great time. Well, at the end of 45 minutes, we couldn't get her off the stage. She was having such a great time. But yeah, it was fun. There exists a scene with Henry Allen and Tina McGee in front of computers where we are really flirting with each other. It didn't make it in the final cut because of the timing issue, but I'm hoping that scene will show up, you know, at some point. Maybe after some sort of crisis, huh? Who knows? So we have one question here. So you've mentioned a couple of things about authenticity, sacred spaces, connecting to the people that you're working with. We are from Nowhereville Community Theater people and that safe space and live theater when you're playing off somebody and there's no redo, that's it, you got one chance. What goal do you carry with you or a, a someone that you acted with that you take with you always, like that's my favorite ever and there's no, nothing can touch that. What do you carry with you? I have to say that I had the good fortune to be in the right place at the right time when the American cast was auditioned and re-blocked and redesigned and went into Broadway in Brian Friel's Dancing at Lunacy, which won the Tony that year for Best Drama. And I got to play Jerry Evans, the Welsh wastrel, you know? And I so loved Jerry because in some ways he reminded me of myself. He was so uh, uh, at the top of his emotions a lot. He was aspirational, you know? Uh, his aspirations far exceeded his accomplishments. I was, for Jerry, I always felt he was always spinning plates. And he would try to keep them all spinning, he'd try to keep them all spinning, and inevitably they'd all crash to the ground, he'd laugh and start over. And I loved being a part of that production. When I saw the Irish cast do that play, when they were asking me to go into it, I left the theater a different person than I was when I went in. The same thing happened when I saw Night Mother, those long stretches of silence, and men were sobbing audibly in the audience. Another reason for doing conventions, you know, we could all be having a good time in, on a soundstage, right? We could all think we're just, you know, cute as bees, you know, and, and think we're doing such a great time, but if we're only acting for ourselves, who cares? You don't get the audience reaction in the studio. This is where we come to get the audience reaction, and that's why I say, I find out more about you guys than you find about out about me, and I'm so grateful for you. I'm very grateful. Okay, so I think we've got one last question here. So, uh, were you ever uh, approached to do the role of Henry Allen in the Justice League movie? Also, what do you think about the version of Flash in the Justice League movie? I was not approached. I was delighted when I heard that his name has gone right out of my head. Who played him? Ezra Miller. No, no, not Ezra, the father. Oh. Billy Crudup. Billy Crudup. Billy Crudup. One of the, I've admired his work with for his years. Season. And I was, I was so pleased when I heard he was going to be doing Henry Allen, because who better? And with a third of the material that they gave them for that prison scene, Grant and I had much more material, you know, to work with. 
um, and in a, with a third of the material, cut up, nailed it. Then when he's the phone to his ear, and he's still trying to communicate to his side of the guards, don't take it away. The fact that he could work that up that fast, you know, my hat was off to him. I enjoy Ezra Miller very much as a performer, and I look forward to seeing more of his flash. I think they kind of shortchanged him in the DCEU movie by using him as comic relief. For sure. You know, at the point at which Aquaman said, oh, he's tripping over his own feet, he's tripping over my feet. I said, oh no, you did not do that to my flash. <laughs> at a convention recently in a QA and I said that and said, well, Jason Momoa is right over there. You may want to go tell him that. Said, no way. <laughs> all right, so I think uh, we're going to wrap, but we've got one thing that we wanted to mention. So first of all, I need to, uh, on behalf of 18-year-old Ted, um, where the hell did all my hair go? And second of all, oh my God, I'm talking to John Wesley's show. So, <laughs> We had something that uh, he wanted to do. Okay, so uh, John and I are going to Santiago, Chile yes. in November, and we want you guys all to be a part of it. Uh, John's going to do a shout out to the convention. He's going to say, Hi, I'm John Wesley Ship. Come see me in Santiago, Chile, November 1st to the 3rd at Superfest Chile. We want you guys to yell I'm going to say all that. Yeah, and then they're going to yell Superfest. Okay, would everybody stand up and come to the middle? And Bob, yeah, if you stand up there, and I'm gonna get in here. Everybody get in! I'll be over here. Close, 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 close. What's the name of it again? Remember, first of all, through the third. When he says it, you know, super fast Chile. Tell me what. Hi, this is John Wesley Schiff from The Flash. I'm looking forward to coming to Santiago, Chile, November 1st through the 3rd to Mega Fest Chile. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll pause. I'll say to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll go like this. <laughs> okay. That was the outcome. Okay. Hi, this is John Wesley Ship from The Flash. I will be coming to Santiago, Chile, November 1st through the 3rd. And I look forward to seeing you at Super Fest Chile! Awesome, you guys are all one.